Welcome everyone to CureSMA's Virtual Summit of Strength webinar series. This is Jessica with CureSMA's Family Support Department, and we thank you all so much for joining with us today. Uh, we would like to thank our national presenting sponsors, Avexis, Biogen, and Genentech, as well as Platinum sponsor, Scholar Rock, for their generous support of the Summit of Strength webinar series. We appreciate all of the questions we received in advance of this webinar, and we'll try to answer many of these during the presentation. You can also submit questions throughout the presentation using the chat box feature, which you will find located on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Please note that all lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for speakers. If you have any questions, please reach out to the Family Support Department at CureSMA by emailing familysupport at curesma.org. And now we are excited to welcome our speaker, Angela Rigglesworth, who is a third grade elementary school teacher and an adult with SMA. We will be, she will be presenting on charismatic independence. Welcome, Angela. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you guys and in such odd circumstances, but, but still really um, thrilled to be presenting this. I am um, super passionate about independence and what that looks like at, at all levels. Um, of life and you'll have to forgive me because i'm kind of cheesy um it's the teacher in me you'll see the picture on the left hand side with me um of me with my students and so everything kind of has a theme so all of my words um have an sma in them and just kind of bear with me i'm sorry i'm i'm corny and I'm, I'm missing my students and can't wait to get back to to real life and to school um i also tried to incorporate um, some COVID tips as well um, during this time, um, what that looks like for, from an independent standpoint. So um, I added that uh, to this presentation as well. So hopefully it will be relevant in this time, but certainly most relevant um, when life gets back to quote unquote normal. So um, again, this is a picture of me with my students. Um, the middle picture is of um, a trip that I took with my husband to the London uh, to London. Uh, we're on the, on the London Eye, which was amazing, and I'm super passionate about traveling. And then um, my husband and I have been married for two years, and that is our wedding day, the happiest day ever. So um, next slide, please. Okay, so here's the cheesy part, right? So you see the SMA in it. So it says start small, the early years of independence. So I'm going to talk about just things that you can do as um, a family that's been newly diagnosed um, or in, in your the childhood age. Um, so next slide. OK, so I'm just going to these are just bulleted tips and I'm just going to kind of expand on them again. If you have questions or if I can kind of further extend my explanation, feel free to to type those into chat and I'll hopefully get to them at the end. Um, but the first one is to think outside the family unit. And I I know when you're um, when you're first diagnosed, uh, when you're experiencing kind of this wave of what do, what do we do and you immediately think, OK, just this little unit that you're in of, of your family and, and what that's going to look like for for the, the people that are directly in your home. And I want everybody um, to think outside of that unit, because um, as you as your child ages, as you with SMA ages um, age, it's not always going to be just your parents and your immediate family taking care of you. And I, I say this at the conference every year that as soon as you can, as soon as you're financially able, I highly encourage you um, to have a caregiver start coming in and providing care um, for your child with SMA. Um, I think that if I could go back and do life over again, that would be the number one thing I would tell my family and my parents. And granted, it looked very different in the, in the late 70s and, and early 80s as I was growing up, but most certainly having other people come in um, so you can start getting used to the fact that you're not going to be the only one to take care of your child forever. It makes that process so much easier. Um, travel while you can to those big, amazing places. Um, it's, I'm not going to lie, it's definitely much easier to travel um, with a little wheelchair and the equipment that comes with being a kid because things are much smaller. But I think that um, my family definitely, we, we traveled quite a bit and my parents instilled the travel bug in me. And so even though it is more difficult as an adult to travel, I just, I know that at the end of the day, it's going to be worth it. It's worth it to see, um, to see the world and to see how much, um, you know, how much there is to offer for people with disabilities all over the world. So I highly encourage you as your child is young to travel as much as you're able to. 
Develop care routines that can grow as your child ages. Um, this may sound a little bit strange, but um, I think a lot about uh, when um, my parents were helping me learn how to change clothes and what that looked like for us. So my mom and dad um, always helped me change clothes in my wheelchair so that when we went public places um, and I needed to use the restroom or things like that, they were able to help me and not have to worry about finding a place to lay down. And granted, that may not work for everybody, and I'm just giving an example, but think about um, what care looks like outside of your home as well, not just with the ease and um, you know the, the ability to just lay down in bed or to use an accessible uh, restroom. So um, when you're making plans for what that looks like and as your child's body is changing and getting bigger, um, how can you create routines that can translate into other settings? I think that that's, that's a really important part um, of your child becoming independent. Um, establish reasonable eating habits. Oh, y'all. It's so hard <laughs> as a person um, who is pretty immobile. I mean, I, I roll around in my chair all day and I pretend that, you know, that I'm like burning calories and I'll put on my yoga pants or whatever. And but the reality is, is that I'm not burning a lot of calories during the day. And so um, my friends that, that have really great eating habits, I think that that started when they were younger and their parents really got them into the routine of of healthy eating because calories do count and they add up. And I, I think with SMA, so many of us either, you know, battle with being underweight or we battle with being overweight. And I, I certainly am, am on the overweight um, side, especially now during COVID. Um, those sweets and treats are so fun to bake when you're bored, but, but most certainly um, really be aware of the fact that that your, your child is gonna have to be thinking about calories um, way more than, than people um, who do not have SMA. And, and so getting into those good eating habits are just key. Um, allow risk taking. Yeah, so <laughs> my dad it was a hippie from California and my mom was a very uh, proper Texan and so they kind of met in the middle and balanced each other out when it comes to uh, their parenting. And they really let me take a lot of risks. And I know that my mom was probably panicked the entire time. And my dad was smiling from ear to ear when I would do things like go water skiing at the accessible water skiing fair. And it was kind of one of those things where I would, I would tell my mom the things that I did after I did them. Um, because I, I, I knew that she would just worry and I, I wanted to be able to, to do things that people maybe didn't think that I could do. And another example would be, um, you know, when I, when I turned 16 and I, I wasn't able to drive, um, my parents, uh, let my friends drive my vehicle. And, you know, I think that, that my parents were just kind of always, um, allowing me to take to take risks and being risk takers themselves. And that that kind of is counterintuitive for being a parent of, of a child with special needs or being a person who um, has um, SMA. I, I think we are just kind of taught to be um, very, very careful. And by no means am I encouraging you to, to do crazy and wild things all the time. But I think that unless you're willing to take risks, um, you, you might miss out on the, the really um, amazing things that you can do in life. Uh, create chores and responsibilities. So um, kids with SMA need those chores. They need those responsibilities just like everybody else does um, because that's that's where you learn the, the behaviors of becoming an adult. Adulting um, doesn't stop just because I have SMA. I still have those um, responsibilities that I need to take care of. I, I now hire people to help me with the chores around the house. But even if it's something as simple as setting out um, the silverware on the table or being in charge of um, setting Alexa for a timer. And my husband would tell you now that that's my, that's my chore while he's cooking is to, I'm in charge of the timer. And as simple and silly as that, it, it's, it, it fills me and it's, it's something that's important. And as a child, um, no matter what your um, level of SMA is, there's something that your child can do um, as far as being responsible for chores in the home. Education is key. So my favorite SMA fact is that we are statistically smarter than the average population, and that's going to get you everywhere. Um, being in school, having, um, you know, the 
the education plan set out before you so that you will maximize uh, your child's potential to succeed because that 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 brain in their head is what's what's going to get them the furthest and certainly has um, my parents never pressured me but certainly held me to some high expectations of, of what I could accomplish. Uh, preventative dental care is worth its weight in gold and uh, when I gave this this chat in Houston a couple months ago I, I, I know this sounds so strange but whatever those sealant things are called. I don't know if it's called something different, but I got sealants when I was a kid and it prevented me from having cavities. I'm 42 years old and I've never had a cavity. Somebody knock on wood for me, please, because I feel so lucky. And I know that it is because my parents um, put those sealants on my teeth. And with SMA, our jaws tend to get tighter and it gets more and more difficult um, to go to the dentist and to have um, those procedures and things done. So um, early care with, with your teeth is, is just so, so beneficial later on. And then lastly, um, seek the advice of other parents and SMAers as your child is in um, these early stages of independence. And, um, you know, when my mom and dad first received my diagnosis in early 1979, they certainly did not have the resources that we have now. Um, they couldn't hop onto a chat group um, or, or see a Facebook group that, that would be able to provide them with, with such resources. They didn't have Cure SMA with, you know, their endless resources on their website and, and just really those connections with people. Um, I highly recommend you um, to get your SMA buddy um, and get your SMA family that you're gonna be able to bounce ideas back and forth. Um, next slide, please. Okay, make smart choices. So independence as a teen, um, as a third grade teacher, I'm constantly telling my students that life is about choices. Um, choices that we make are key to our success, but especially as a teen, and you're going to be asked to make a lot of choices that your friends aren't. And unfortunately, um, that's one of the things that we um, are challenged with as um, teens with SMA and as adults with SMA, but those smart choices will lead to your success and to your independence. And that's ultimately um, what your goal is. Uh, next slide, please. So perfect the art of asking for help. Um, if I could literally wear a shirt um, that says the art of asking for help, like so that people will come up and say, what are you talking about? Because I believe with my whole heart that the key to independence is being able to ask for help. And it's truly an art form. It's not something that we can uh, just, you know, randomly um, say, help me do this. I think as teens especially, and if you're a teen listening right now, you're gonna relate. If you're a parent of a teen right now, you're going to relate. But when I was a teenager, I very often did not speak to my mother in the kind voice that I should have. And I took for granted um, just the availability of my parents to do things for me and to understand what it was that I needed with very minimal communication. And the fact of the matter is, is that I went off to college at 18 years old and I lived with a friend um, who did not communicate in the same way that my parents did. And I had to learn um, that asking her for help had to be done in a way so that she wanted to do it again. Right, so barking orders and, and demanding things and, and the way that we can so easily get caught up in, in our, our teenage years is not the way um, that we need to be practicing asking for help. It's an art form in the way that you say something to somebody such that you have such charisma and you have such kindness that people wanna help you over and over again. Because that moment of needing something picked up on off of the floor is not an isolated event. You're going to need something picked up off the floor. You're going to need to be adjusted in your chair or you're going to need et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you do it in a way um, that is kind and appreciative, then people wanna to continue to help you and it will be much easier um, to develop those relationships and keep those relationships with friends and caregivers and your loved ones, especially your parents. Getting involved. I think that, um, you know, I, I always joke that I am a, um, a champion shopper 
because my parents, um, you know, realized that I wasn't going to dance classes and I wasn't going to sports. And so they thought, okay, well, what, what can I do? And so my mom and dad would drop me and a friend off at the mall and I would shop around for, you know, hours and it, it would be my sport. And to this day, I, I still love shopping. It's my most favorite activity. I think I'm like a gold medalist in, in shopping. Um, but I got involved in, in that activity. I got involved in student council in, in middle school and high school. I got involved in choir, um, which was great exercise for my lungs. Although I don't even know how I was in choir because I cannot sing at all anymore. Um, but just whatever it was, it was, um, my passion i wanted to pursue it in some sort of organization and that's where my friends came from and that's where that that circle of friends is which bumps me over to to the other side and i'll i'll get to that in just a second um personal care i i think that when you're a teen this is the age when you're starting to develop um the need to express yourself in in what you need um to to be cared for personally so for example um, my mom and y'all are going to laugh. I know you're going to listen to this and you're going to laugh. My mom and I fought the most about cutting my toenails. And I'm, I'm not even joking. Like rip roaring arguments would come from fighting over clipping my nails, which is so disgusting that I'm even saying that on a, a webcam. Um, but I am because I want you to be aware that these kinds of self care arguments happen. And so, the sooner you can get into these routines of going to getting a manicure or getting a pedicure, having someone else other than your mom or dad um, deal with those sort of self-care things, um, it makes a big difference. Having, um, getting your hair done. I've got a, a hair washing board that I got on Amazon. It's literally $10. And it enables me to be able to go to the hair salon and I can get my hair washed and um, well, now I have to get it colored because I have so many gray hairs, but that's that's later on the next slide. Um, but things like that, that, that you can go ahead and start getting into routines of, of having someone else help you with, with your personal care and just being aware of, of parts of your body that need to be washed and you're gonna have to explain that to somebody. Hey, can you please help me? keeping college and beyond in mind. So um, literally starting from middle school, I was ready to go to college and I was thinking about what that was gonna look like and having that plan already and talking to my parents about it. I didn't turn 18 and become a senior in high school and then spring it on my mom and dad that I wanted to go away to school. We started talking about it and having those conversations very early on so that when the time came, we were more prepared and we were ready and we can make plans for what that would look like. So, um, you know, I know many people who have various ranges of SMA, um, so somebody who's very independent, almost on their own to someone who requires full care that was able to go away to college. And I think that that is something that is definitely doable. It's possible that you have to have the mentality and you've got to have the plan ahead. So the earlier you can start thinking about it, the better. Um, so going back to circle of friends, yeah, I, I just, I can't emphasize enough. And this is really for any teen, this is for any adult, that your friends are always a reflection of you. And so the people that you surround yourself with and the friends that you choose are a reflection of your character. And so for me, I wanna be around people who love helping, right? I love helping in whatever way I can. And I wanna be around friends who also want to help so that they can help me to participate in life fully. And so choosing that circle of friends through the organizations that you're involved in, through um, going to camp, through who you meet, um, through Cure SMA, wherever it is that you've, you've met your circle of friends, make sure that they are a reflection of who you want to be. Um, finally, creative solutions, which is perfect timing because my hair is kind of falling in my face right now and I need to brush it out. So thinking of things, and I'll hold it up, this is an extra long stylus and I use it to fix my hair, little things like that. So, um, you know, different types of reachers and grabbers um, that will help you. I honestly, I can remember being a teen and being home alone and I dropped my homework and I was chewing some gum and I stuck my gum on the end of a pencil and I reached down and picked up the paper 
um, with a very sticky piece of gum, but really just getting creative and, and thinking of solutions to problems. Um, when I'm putting on my makeup, I order extra long brushes from Amazon because I can't reach up my hand up very high to my face, but with an extra long brush, I'm able to put my makeup on by myself. So getting creative, it doesn't always have to be, you know, something that you buy from the durable medical equipment company that costs, you know, $200. It could be something as simple as, you know, an extra long stylus. It doesn't cost anything else. So being creative with those solutions. Next slide, please. Dismantle stereotypes. I was kind of reaching for the SMA in that one, right? I know. Uh, changing the norms of the adult experience. So, you know, people, stereotypes, ugh, they just disgust me because I, I, I get so frustrated when people, um, you know, I'll tell them that I'm a school teacher and people just think, oh my gosh, that is a miracle. That's the greatest thing. I can't even believe it. And granted, I understand and I, I can appreciate that people maybe don't have exposure to someone who has a disability and is, is successful in their career. But the reality is, is I want to eliminate those stereotypes. I want everyone with a disability to be independent and successful in their job so that it's not a shock that I'm a school teacher. It's not a shock that my friend is a lawyer who has SMA. It's just it's just common and it's 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 something that everyone is used to because we see we see it all the time. So it's up to you if you're listening with SMA to help me to dismantle those stereotypes. Next slide, please. OK, so it, it, being an adult, it, it's a lot and it's a lot of planning and it's a lot of thinking and putting others before you, but it can be done. The first thing I, I would encourage you to think about is funding for your caregiving. So um, I literally could do an entire session about caregiving funding 50 different times because we have 50 different states. And honestly, it's different in every state. And unfortunately, I do not have time um, to go into all of that. What I can do is give you, give you a couple of buzzwords that I think that you should be thinking about or be asking about and researching. So obviously the first one that comes to mind is SSI, Social Security Income. So that's something that would help you with um, funding. Um, I would also um, encourage you to look up Medicaid buy-in. Um, that's what I use here in the state of Texas. Um, and then also there's um, rehab departments, Department of Rehab Services. Um, that helps with um, caregiving when you're in college, or at least they did for me here in Texas. So really familiarizing yourself with different caregiving options, um, housing options, uh, different caregiving funding rather, um, housing options. Well, again, we're going to get we're going to get creative, right? Because you don't walk into an apartment complex and they have this beautiful wheelchair accessible apartment ready and waiting for you. And if you have found that, I am going to tell you to sign the dotted line because that is a gem, a diamond in the rough for sure, because they don't exist. And so really thinking about what are my options for housing? What what would that look like if I lived in this space? My husband um, bought a house before we met. It's a 1953 home that apparently people were really skinny in 1953 because our bathroom was tiny and unfortunately we when I moved in we had to make um, some adjustments and we had to um, have a contractor come out and widen the doors and put in a wheelchair um, accessible shower and that may not always be um, a financial ability for you and your family and so again you've got to think what would this look like um, if, if my child lived here what would this look like if I'm an adult and I'm living here so there are solutions um, I lived in an apartment that was not very accessible at all, and I used a shower chair that slid from the toilet over into the bathtub. So um, things like that of, of really getting creative and, and thinking, how, how is it that I can live here and what would that look like? Um, well woman and well man exams, I call it well man exams, which I don't even really know um, what age that should start at for men. So if you're an, an adult man on this, um, Webinar, I'm sorry, I didn't do my research for you. Um, but well woman exams are so important because um, diseases in regards to fertility um, do not ignore women just because we have SMA. 
unfortunately, those sorts of diseases are going to knock on the door and they're going to come right in. And so you have to be very aware um, and you have to be um, be checked regularly. And unfortunately, so many women who um, have SMA and other disabilities do not go for their well woman exam because they don't um, have the ability um, to go to a doctor's office that's accessible. And so researching and calling your doctor in advance, one thing that I always had to do um, with my well woman exam, and keep in mind, I live in Houston and we have a huge medical um, system here. And, and you would think that we have just these amazing facilities, but we don't. And so for those of you that are in small towns, um, one solution that I would encourage you to ask is that you have your well woman exam done um, in a larger procedure room. So instead of the typical smaller room, where they do well woman exams, you can say, can we please do it in the procedure room? Because those rooms are usually much bigger. They have different types of tables that oftentimes raise and lower and that makes things easier. Um, so that's my advice with well woman, but it is essential. I would also say, um, I didn't know this until last year when I got my first um, breast exam, but um, the newer machines are actually pretty wheelchair friendly. So I didn't have to, I, I went by myself. I didn't even bring a caregiver. I literally got on the city bus and went downtown and got my um, breast exam and was able to do that from my wheelchair. So it can be done, don't be discouraged. Um, ABLE accounts, oh my goodness. This is another one of those that I could go on forever and I'm noticing my time. So I'm gonna speed things up just a little bit. But ABLE accounts are an awesome way that you can save um, in some states up to $30,000 a year, if I'm not mistaken, um, that doesn't count against any of your um, resources or benefits that you might be receiving. And you can save up into the 200,000. So those of you who have a child that's just been diagnosed, I cannot emphasize enough how much I would recommend opening an ABLE account and going ahead and putting away money um, every month, every year, whatever you can do, even if it's a little bit, because your child can use those funds for caregiving later on or making um, modifications to their homes, all, all sorts of different things. So please, please research an ABLE account. Um, workplace accommodations, it's funny because this is so applicable to me right now. I've recently had to file with my ADA office in my school district um, so that I can work from home as the home teach, teach from home teacher this year because I'm obviously very concerned about going back um, with COVID. So um, don't be afraid to ask for the things that you need at work. My school district pays for me to have an aid. No one else in my school gets that, but they recognize that I'm a great teacher and in order to be a great teacher, I need assistance during the day. And so they're willing to pay for that. It's, it's the worst that someone is going to say at work is no. And then you move on and then you think of something else. But definitely don't be afraid to ask. Uh, create your village. I think that um, the reason why I've been able to be um, independent and successful is because my caregiving team, um, they are my family and they are part of my village. So even when somebody stops working for me, they're on my short list of people that I'm going to call for backup, for help, or just reach back out and, and say, hey, how are you? Keeping, keeping those people in your circle and your, your caregivers, um, you know, close to you and, and, and checking in on them and making sure that um, you, you still consider them um, a friend will really benefit you and keeping your village um, packed full of people who can be your help, your assistance as an adult. Confidence is key. Um, I think I wrote that in regards because I was getting a lot of questions about relationships. Oh good, I just got a little chat about it. I don't have to rush. Okay, that makes me feel better. Um, confidence is key when it comes to um, finding your partner in life. And I um, I was 40 when I got married and, and Justin and I have been together for six years. So it took, it took me a while to find Prince Charming. Um, but I really believe that the, the, what initially drew him to me was that I was confident and I was comfortable in my own skin of who I am. And so the sooner that you can become confident with who you are, the sooner you're going to be able to find that person who sees that wonderful you. Technology is your friend. Oh my goodness. I'm nervous to say her name because she's right next to me. Um, but Alexa, uh, Alexa, did y'all hear me? I think so. 
um, she is wonderful and she helps me do so much around the house. I have so much connected to her with lights and um, adjusting the thermostat and, and just in general, um, using that sort of technology is so helpful. Um, I have a door opener, it's called an open sesame so that I can get in and out of my home and it has a locking feature so I don't have to worry about, oh, I can't turn the key and, and lock the door. Um, so open sesame is a, is a wonderful thing and there's lots of brands out there. And actually the Department of um, Rehab paid for um, that open door. In fact, I have two open doors in my house um, because it was an, a reasonable accommodation. I have to be able to get in and out of my home in order to go to work. Um, and then finally on um, the adult side, make travel plans. You know, I, I know that so many people are thinking, oh my gosh, I, I can't even imagine getting on an airplane with a wheelchair and, and what do you do? How do you do that? And I, yes, literally I was on the news this time last year because Air Canada took apart my chair. It happens a hundred percent, but I can tell you that my trip to Canada, it was the most, Montreal is the most beautiful city and I had such a lovely time and I wouldn't trade that experience for not having, for, you know, for not having to experience my wheelchair being broken, broken down and because they pay for it to be repaired. One big tip, and again, I could do a whole travel session as well, but one big tip that I would tell you um, is to travel on a day, like during the day, so that on a weekday, when you land, there will be a durable medical equipment company that would be open so that in case you, something's wrong with your wheelchair, they could send a technician out or there would be a wheelchair on the, on, from that company that you could borrow until yours was um, repaired or fixed. Same with like using that, borrowing medical equipment when you go to other cities. You can rent Hoyer lifts, you can rent wheelchairs, you could even rent battery chargers, um, and it's fairly reasonable um, to do so. So please, please travel. There's so much to do in this world, and you shouldn't be limited because you have SMA. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the one I added. We are smack dab in the middle. And we are. I don't think this COVID thing is gonna end as quickly as we thought it was, but let's look at independence um, in the time of COVID. Next slide, please. Look y'all, I'm doing my little thing with my hair. Okay, here we go. Um, how can I gain, maintain independence during the coronavirus? So really, um, what does that look like? And I'm gonna share something. I actually made this slide before I, um, I did this. I realized I was having a lot of anxiety about um, contracting COVID. Um, obviously from the standpoint of just having SMA and getting sick in general, but also because I thought who, who's going to provide my care? So my husband, and, my husband is not my caregiver and granted he is an awesome chef and makes us dinner and if my, legs are uncomfortable, he'll help prop him up on a pillow, but for the most part, um, our our home, he, he is not my caregiver. I have a team of, of five people that come in, um, but I was really worried about, are they going to be able to come in if I have COVID, because are they going to be willing to be exposed, and so my, my, my thoughts just I, I just was so worried and I'm not a really anxious person and I realized that it was really bothering me. And so I thought, what can I do to be proactive? And so what I did is I went ahead and purchased um, full PPE. I got um, uh, goggles and a, a face shield and masks and gloves and um, the things that you put on your um, your body like a gown and I got the booty covers, like literally I got everything um, for my caregivers and I sent an email or a text message actually to my entire team and I, I thought it out really carefully and I, I sent it in the most loving and appreciative way that I could, but I basically asked my caregivers which one of them would be willing to be on my um, COVID care team if I were to get sick given uh, proper PPE that would be provided in the hospital. Um, and I said to them, I completely understand if you don't want to, um, but here, here's, here's what I'm asking so that I don't go into panic mode when I sneeze, right? Doesn't everyone do that right now? You get a little tickle in your throat and you panic that you have COVID. And so I think for me, being proactive has alleviated so much of that stress. 
all but one of my caregivers said that they were willing to come in. So I have a, a team that I know I can count on. Um, and I was able to go ahead and order those items and just be prepared. Um, call, and that's what I would also mean um, in call in reinforcement. So um, who, who are those people um, that, that can help you? Um, show extra appreciation for care. Um, you know, everybody's just so worried about exposing each other. And I wear a mask every time my caregivers come in and they wear a mask too. Um, but I, I'm just loving on them as much as I can right now to let them know how much I appreciate um, their willingness to be with me during such difficult time. I also show appreciation to them for those that have kind of changed their lifestyle because I you know, I have caregivers that are, are constantly asking me, would you mind if I did this? Would you mind if I did that from a socialization standpoint? And, and just the fact that they're merely asking me uh, means everything. Um, have a hospital plan. So having all your paperwork and your documents um, ready to go so that uh, when if you are, you know, indeed having to go to the hospital, you're ready for that. And, and the people who will care for you at the hospital are prepared as well. Um, take advantage of those online health exams. I've gotten to see some doctors in the same format that I'm talking to you now, um, which is honestly, I wish they would do that from like here on out because it makes it so much easier not having to travel um, for certain types of exams. Um, mental health is certainly a priority. Um, as I said before, I was really developing some, some pretty big anxieties and given that I'm, I'm not an anxious person, I cannot even imagine um, the stress that many people are feeling who deal with that on a daily basis. Um, and in order to deal with that mental health, obviously, you know, relying on a professional, um, talking to your friends, but especially rely on those others, as I spoke before, who have SMA or a family um, that has a child with SMA. Talk to each other. Um, please lean on each other during this time. Again, that goes along with staying connected. connected rather. Utilize delivery services. So Amazon Prime is like my best friend because I did not realize that if you um, had a $35 grocery charge, it's a free delivery. And so um, Justin and I have definitely been taking advantage of that um, and those delivery services, as well as many big cities are um, uh, uh, delivering PPE to people with disabilities. So you might wanna do a Google search in your, in your uh, community. Be aware of your state services and benefits changes. So um, here in Texas, I haven't had to pay my copay for Medicaid buy-in because they um, are, it, since we're in the pandemic, they're not collecting those copays, um, as well as they're not um, asking for recertifications. They're, they're just automatically granting people access to the program for another year. So that's something definitely that might encourage you to go ahead and look that up. Apply for local grants. Um, we've actually benefited already from several organizations um, that are um, providing grants for people so that you can purchase PPE or pay for extra caregiving or whatever it is. Again, a Google search for um, those grants could really um, bring some extra income in. And then finally, um, and this is really the key for life in general, and that is to be positive. Um, as hard as it is, when I feel those um, just kind of negative thoughts seeping in, as cliche as it sounds, I literally actively think of things in a positive way. And I, I, I have to change the channel um, in my mind so that I, I don't allow myself to be overwhelmed with all of this. I think the teens and children that are listening to this message, um, it's certainly hard um, because it's, it's hard to, to realize how big life is when you're young. Um, for parents, I think that we all are aware that this is just a moment in time and this will get better, um, but helping your children and your teens to understand that um, and being as positive as you can is really the key to, to making it through COVID and to be as independent as you can. So next slide, please. And that's it. Um, this is my email address. I have a consulting company. Um, to kind of help people um, through these stages of life and being independent. Feel free to reach out to me um, if I can help you in any way or if I can kind of elaborate on any of the things that we talked about if I don't get a chance um, to in the questions. So I think it's question time. Great. Thank you so much, Angela.
Hello, everyone. This is Colleen McCarthy O'Toole with the Cure SMA Family Support Department. We're going to go ahead and go over a few questions that have come in from our community. So the first question is, how do you deal with the difficulties of working or finding a job with SMA when our bodies get tired and we can't sit in our chairs for the whole day? I've struggled with finding work and necessary help in this area. What adaptations do you use to help you? That's a great question. So for, for me right now, my, my adaptation is, is Spinraza because it has definitely improved my um, ability to just keep going at the end of the day. Um, but for those that aren't taking an, a treatment drug right now, um, I would just say, and in fact, it's kind of exciting um, because COVID has really opened up the web even more. I never thought we could expand the internet even more than we have. But I think that jobs that from home are really going to, to exponentially grow. And so thinking about a job perhaps that you could do from home um, would be something that would help. Um, I asked my, um, I worked in a school district for um, 16 years. And then when I got married, I, I changed to a new school district. And I didn't know if they were gonna be comfortable with providing me with an aid um, because that you know teaching is exhausting and so um but all i did was ask i literally just said i i'm a little bit more expensive but i'm worth it because i'm a good teacher and so they they paid for that aid for me and that definitely helps a lot with my fatigue um but certainly i would i would just encourage you um to uh ask for those accommodations at work and to be thinking about some maybe at home positions um, that would help you. The, the final thing that I would say um, is I, I really push myself a lot. I push through those tired times. Um, and that takes, you know, a lot of practice to be able to do that. And I take a lot of naps and I drink a lot of Starbucks. So there we go. Great. Thanks, Angela. The second question is, what is something that you wish you knew as you turned 18 years old regarding receiving care or even navigating school? Oh, such a good question. In fact, I should have said this. So I'm so glad that you asked that. Um, I always naively received my benefits. People would ask, oh, what program are you on? What are you utilizing? And I would say, yeah, and I don't really know. I just know that my caregiving is paid for. It is so important for you to completely understand all of the verbiage, all of the wording that's associated with your state and the programs that you're on so that you are so knowledgeable and that you know your rights. When I turned 18, I wish so much that I would have done all the research um, to fully understand all of the benefits um, that I could have in my state. I did not know that my state pays for um, my uh, insurance. So the money that I pay out of my check for my insurance every month, my state reimburses me. Y'all, I just found that out two years ago. Literally, for all of these years, I could have been benefiting from this program um, financially to help me um, pay for care because I pay out of pocket for my care as well for some of my hours. So, um, but I, I just didn't know and I wasn't well researched. And so if if you are turning 18, if you are 16 and you are capable of getting online and really understanding your rights and understanding the different programs that you could benefit from, um, I highly recommend doing that. Great. Thank you. The next question is, how do you go about dating when having a disability? Do you have any advice or tips? Yeah, so I, I would go back again and just say confidence is key. It is everything. And if you are not um, comfortable with who you are yet, then you are not ready to meet um, your partner. But once I was ready and I wasn't ready really until my late 20s and I didn't I didn't date. I didn't go on dates. Um, and then I, I really just kind of um, kind of came into my own and I was comfortable in my skin and I, I started dating and I I would just um I, I definitely benefited from dating online i met my husband on a on a website um he had just moved to houston and was looking to to meet people and we met and um it was wonderful and i i think that um i think if you in your heart feel that you were made for a relationship 
than you are. I think there are some people that go through life that think, you know, I'm, I'm okay being single and that's great. But there are, for me personally, I knew that I was meant to be a partner and I, you know, I don't, I don't perform, you know, the, the typical wife type roles. Um, and I really, it shouldn't even say that now, I think, but I, but as far as being um, a partner, I don't cook and I don't clean and I don't do, um, you know, I don't help in yard work and things like that as, as far as what a typical um, partnership looks like. Um, but I also know that I bring so much else to the table in regards to um, my relationship with my husband. And so as you are dating, I want you to think about what is it that I can bring and what is it that um, is so great about me? And when you know what's great about you, then someone else is going to know that too. So be confident. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, the fourth question is, what is your purpose? What's that thing that gets you out of bed every day when you're feeling bad and has it changed over time? Wow, that's an awesome question. Um, I, my purpose, I'm definitely am a woman of faith and I, I definitely um, um, have a God that I wake up to every day and I know that has blessed me and I respect that not everybody feels that way as well. And so you, you have something else. Um, my purpose is to um, be a great friend. It is to be a great wife and a great teacher. Um, and so my purpose is that I have purpose, is that I know what I'm meant to do and what I'm, um, what my day is going to look like. And, and I think that that in and of itself is motivating. Um, and so once you know what your purpose is in life, then that will give you, um, that, that motivation to get it, to get up and out of bed. But I'm not going to lie. It is not easy. I have to get up at 5.30 and in some nights, and rather some mornings, I swear my caregiver has me like half dressed which before I'm fully awake. Um, but just having things to look forward to, I think as well um, in that day, day to day um, really is, is a motivator as well. So find your purpose and you'll have purpose. Great, thank you. And we just have one last question here. Have you tried hiring live-in assistants? And if so, how did that go? That's so funny because we're, I'm actually on a Facebook group and we've been talking about have people that have been talking about that. Um, I did have live in roommates um, that were my friends and we lived together. Um, and so I didn't have to find a live in. Um, so I, I don't quite know from that perspective, but I um, I definitely know that it's a really good model. Um, providing room and board for, you know, if, if you don't qualify for a certain um, caregiving benefits in your state, um, most certainly providing a room for someone um, in an exchange for care is, is something that works. Here's my advice for finding a caregiver. When I, um, you know, put up an ad and I've put ads, most recently I've been advertising on my next door app because I think finding somebody in your community is great. Um, but I tell them that you don't need any experience because um, I'm gonna train you and teach you to do exactly what I need you to do. I just need us to have similar personalities so that we we get along with each other. Um, I think that if you find somebody that you can talk to and have a conversation with at whatever time of day, um, that's going to make a huge difference because then you feel comfortable asking that person to do certain tasks for you. Or if you're fussy like me and you like everything in a certain way, if you get along really well with that person, you're gonna find it much easier to ask them versus finding the person who has years and years of experience and, and all of those sorts of things because they not, may not be somebody that you feel comfortable with. Um, and so when you're looking for that live-in, think about who do I want to live with um, as you're interviewing people? Um, if they're you know kind of a, a bummer personality that's maybe not the person for you and keep looking so i think that's it great thank you so much angela for, for taking the time to answer all of the the great questions that came through and again for such a great presentation absolutely we thank you like introduce, okay. <laughs> we would now like to introduce jeremy short who is representing avexis and will be presenting upon choosing treatment presented by avexis Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Also happy SMA Awareness Month. My name is Jeremy Short and I'm a regional medical director representing the Avexis team today. I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to present to you all on the topic of making treatment decisions for SMA. 
I do need to inform you that this presentation is intended only for U.S. residents. Also, I'll be discussing the indication and important safety information for Zolgensma as part of the talk today, so you can view the full prescribing information actually attached to this webinar here, or you can visit zolgensma.com. Next slide, please. So here's a look at our agenda for the next 15 minutes or so. I'm going to share a brief update on Avexis, and then we'll transition a few minutes to cover some general information about Zolgensma, including an important safety review. I'm also excited to be able to share a video from one of our family's experiences so far with Zolgensma treatment. And we'll continue today with a brief discussion about the importance of making a timely and informed treatment decision when facing a diagnosis of SMA. Next slide. So at Avexis, we're dedicated to bringing gene therapies to families who are dealing with life-threatening genetic diseases. We are very proud to be part of this wonderful SMA community and the many advancements in treatment, including our initial gene therapy, Zolgensma, which is now approved in Japan and the European Union, as well as here in the US, with additional registrations pending in nearly three dozen countries. So the clinical uh, study for the intrathecal administration of Zolgensma, known as the STRONG study, is currently on hold. STRONG is for patients with three copies of the SMN2 gene and who are within the ages of six months to five years old. So we're working with the FDA and we'll continue providing the community with timely updates on this study as soon as we have more information to share. In the meantime, we're continuing to explore using gene therapy in several new disease states as well including Rett syndrome, a type of familial ALS, and Friedrich's ataxia. Finally, we're lending our manufacturing expertise to help work on a gene-based COVID-19 vaccine that's being studied by the Massachusetts Eye and Ear team, along with Massachusetts General Hospital. And for more information on the clinical development program, you can visit the research and development page, which is located on avexis.com. Next slide, please. As a national premier partner, Avexis has been able to support numerous Cure SMA events, including the Chapter Leader Summit, the annual SMA conference, walk and rolls, and many other awareness events across the country. I know for me personally, the annual conference in Anaheim last year was one of the highlights of my time with Avexis, so I really, really look forward to the day when we can all safely meet together again after the uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna switch gears a bit and give some background information on Zolgensma, which is an FDA approved prescription gene therapy used to treat children less than two years of age with spinal muscular atrophy. And that's regardless of SMA type or copy number. Zolgensma is given as a one-time infusion into a vein over 60 minutes. It has not been evaluated in patients who have advanced SMA. And what we mean by that would be uh, such patients who have complete paralysis of their limbs or permanent dependence on a ventilator. Uh, next slide, please. Zolgensma is designed to target the genetic root cause of SMA by replacing the function of the survival motor neuron 1 gene, or SMN1, which is not functional in people who have SMA. This gene is responsible for making SMN protein. Next slide. So we know that SMN protein is necessary to help us maintain healthy and functional motor neuron cells. When this protein is missing, the cells can't continue to do their job of sending signals to control muscle function. When we can't properly stimulate our muscles to move, they weaken over time. Eventually, this can affect not only movement, but eating, breathing, speech, and the condition can become life-threatening in its more severe forms. Next slide, please. So Zolgensma uses something called a vector, which functions like a vehicle to, to uh, deliver a working SMN gene back into the motor neuron cells of the body. This new working gene provides the cells with the DNA recipe that they need in order to make SMN protein. Next slide. So I'll talk a little bit more about the vector itself. So again, this is the vehicle that is responsible for carrying the new SMN gene into cells. The vector is called adeno-associated virus 9, or AAV9. 
this is a naturally occurring virus that is not known to make people sick. But to make Zolgensma, the existing viral DNA is removed completely and it's replaced with a fully functional human SMN gene. So this new gene will allow cells to create SMN protein without the gene becoming part of the child's own DNA. The number nine refers to AAV serotype nine. This is important because we know that AAV9 specifically is able to cross the blood-brain barrier, and so it allows it to reach the motor neuron cell population that we really need to target for SMA treatment. Next slide, please. So once the vector is able to deliver the SMN gene to the motor neuron cells, the gene is taken up into the nucleus of the cell where that DNA recipe can then be read in order to make SMN protein. With a restored ability to make SMN protein, motor neuron cells that remain alive may be able to survive and maintain their function. Next slide, please. So Gensma can cause acute serious liver injury. Liver enzymes could become elevated and may reflect acute serious liver injury in children who receive Zolgensma. Patients will receive an oral corticosteroid before and after infusion with Zolgensma and will undergo regular blood tests to monitor liver function. Contact the patient's doctor immediately if the patient's skin and or the whites of the eyes appear yellowish, or if the patient misses a dose of the corticosteroid or vomits it up. Viral respiratory infections before or after Zolgensma infusion can lead to more serious complications. Contact the patient's doctor immediately if you see signs of a possible viral respiratory infection, such as coughing, wheezing, sneezing, runny nose, sore throat, or fever. Decreased platelet counts could also occur following infusion with Zolgensma, so seek immediate medical attention if the patient experiences any unexpected bleeding or bruising. Next slide, please. Talk to your doctor to decide if adjustments to the routine vaccination schedule are needed to accommodate treatment with the corticosteroid. We do uh, recommend protection against respiratory syncytial virus or RSV as well. Temporarily, small amounts of Zolgensma may be found in the patient's stool. They use good hand hygiene when coming into direct contact with bodily waste for one month after infusion with Zolgensma. Disposable diapers should be sealed in disposable trash bags and thrown out with the regular trash. The most common side effects that occurred in patients treated with Zolgensma in the clinical trials were elevated liver enzymes and vomiting. This is certainly not meant to be a comprehensive safety list, so please do talk with your treatment team about any side effects that are bothersome or do not go away. We encourage reporting of all side effects by using any of the methods that are listed here on this slide. Next slide, please. And I wanted to briefly provide an additional safety update. So, so in addition to what we talked about from the prescribing information, this is as of December 2019. There have now been 100 patients treated with IV Zolgensma in the clinical trial program. And these children have ranged uh, in age from 0.3 up to 7.9 months of age at the time they received gene therapy. And now in, in the longest case have, have been followed up to five and a half years after dosing. Since our approval back in May of 2019, reports of pyrexia or fever have been common from both spontaneous reports as well as in the published literature. So of course, we'll continue to capture and share safety information appropriately as we move forward. Next slide. So I'm excited to, to share uh, one family's story about their journey with SMA and treatment with Zolgensma, but Please do remember this is just a single experience and, and every child is, is of course unique and, and My daughter Maisie has spinal muscular atrophy type one. I knew something wasn't right with her. Um, she wasn't moving her legs. She would just lay there. She got weaker and weaker and she eventually just quit eating. The doctors, as much as we were begging them, were not recognizing that there was a valid issue. And so we took Maisie to our physical therapist, who we trusted, and she encouraged us and helped advocate to get Maisie to Denver to seek additional testing. We talked right away about how this might be something bigger, and so 
when she started having even more difficulties when we said, yeah, it's probably time to get some more diagnostics. And that's when she went to Denver. We got to the hospital. The genetic counselor came in. And she said, just so you know, we're testing for SMA. Obviously, we weren't sleeping very good. We spent hours researching SMA and what possibilities there were. When we received the diagnosis that Maisie had SMA, there were two options that we had found. One was FDA approved and the other was in clinical trials and that was Zolgensma. From the beginning, I wanted Zolgensma. We learned was that it was a gene therapy and that it was a one-time treatment. Maisie didn't qualify for the clinical trial, and so because we knew that they would continue to decline, and we started the treatment that had been FDA approved. The treatment, I could see that it had definitely improved her in some of her areas, and then she continued on that treatment, and it got her to Zolgensma. You know, it got her to the treatment date. The FDA approval for Zolgensma came May 24th, 2019 exactly one year from my trip to Denver. Even though Maisie had received another treatment, we still wanted Zolgensma because it's one-time therapy and we continue to fight for it and continue to advocate. I'll always remember the day Maisie received Zolgensma. It's five months post-dosing with Zolgensma. Maisie is two years old. She grabs her toes now and she sticks them in her mouth. She sits up and she only wants to sit up. And January 5th, 2020, Maisie said, Mama. You want to go play? Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I just held her and loved her and was like, yay, you said Mama. I wasn't sure if I was ever going to hear that. Even though Maisie's received treatment, Maisie still has SMA. We start every day with CPT or chest physical therapy. She still requires a lot of her machines. Her cough assist is only twice a day. It forces air into her lungs and it expands her lungs and then it sucks it out like a, a strong cough. And then we suction. Maisie requires physical therapy three times a week, and then she also does speech therapy twice a week, and occupational therapy. That's not including the exercises and therapies we do at home. Maisie gets all of her nutrition through a feeding tube. However, we hope that someday she has the ability to eat, and we want her to be able to tolerate foods. I expected Zolgens to stop the progression of the disease just halt it and no more getting weaker. And I had hoped that someday she might sit up and be able to see the world we do. She's laughing, she's talking, and she's hitting milestones that were once a dream. I think my little girl's gonna do things that I never even pictured that she would do. We understand that receiving an SMA diagnosis can be very overwhelming. Caregivers are thrown into new territory and learning all about SMA, its management, as well as treatment options. But we also know that time is of the essence and a prompt, informed treatment decision is critical because muscles can weaken quickly without treatment. There are many things to consider when choosing a potential therapy for SMA, including how the treatment works, how it's administered, and a thoughtful exploration of the potential benefits and risks. It's a great idea to develop a list of questions that you can take with you to your next appointment with the neuromuscular care team. And while we're certainly not here to offer medical advice, our goal is to provide caregivers with the information that they need about Zolgensma to help them make an informed choice that works best for their individual situation. Next slide, please. To learn more, you can visit zolgensma.com and speak with your SMA treatment team. So there's also more videos on the website of other families that have allowed us to come along with them on their treatment journeys. We also want to recognize the significant impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on all our communities. So we encourage families to keep working with their neuromuscular treatment providers on the best way to protect their children and family during this difficult time.
Next slide. Thanks so much for your attention and thank you to CureSMA for giving us the opportunity to present to the group today. I wish you all a safe, happy, and healthy close to the summer season. And with that, I'll transition uh, back to Sarah, I believe. So thanks again. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers for your time and fantastic presentations today. We appreciate everyone who's joined in on today's webinar as well. You'll be receiving a follow-up email with a survey link, and we welcome any feedback that you'd like to share with us. We're also thankful for the incredible support from our sponsors for making this Summit of Strength virtual webinar series possible. Thank you again. If there's anything we can do for you, or if you have any additional questions, please email us at familysupport at curesma.org. Have a great day, everyone.